This is 51st Dates, and I'm your host, Jolie Moore. They say that hindsight is 2020. I decided to find out if that's true. Every week, I'm going to read a chapter from my memoir, 51st Dates, and give you the backstory and commentary on what really went down. It's been two whole years since I went on these dates, and I'll be experiencing them along with you as I read. We'll find out together if my future self learned anything. I don't know if I have anything figured out, but at least we'll share some laughs along the way. Dating in Southern California is nothing if not entertaining. Ready? Strap in. Let's go. Welcome to 51st Dates. I'm your host, Jolie Moore. I have turned a corner. I don't know if that's true. Let me not overstate that. Let's say that I think I have moved from identifying problems and wallowing in self-pity to a place in my life where I think what I want is to heal. So I just spent far too long, like an hour and a half, two hours, watching a video on YouTube with Dr. Caroline Leaf, who talks about the five steps for sort of healing your brain and trauma and a bunch of other issues. And I'm thinking a lot about that this summer because I think that I need to take a few months, a couple months, in the time school break, let's call it that, to reassess a lot. And um, it feels daunting, to be frank, but I can't continue on like wallowing in self pity and sort of victimhood or, you know, the story I tell myself about my life. I have to sort of reclaim that and figure out who I want to be going forward. Um, that's so much who I want to be. You know, I keep reading these books and about dating or whatever, and they're like, you need to know who you want to be. Are the are you the person you want to be? Are you, you keep saying, the book suggests that readers are seeking out this perfect person who I don't know, climbs mountains or... I don't know, scales the corporate ladder to the top. You know, I don't know, has a Bentley or a Ferrari. There's a lot of Ferraris around lately. Oh my God, I think I saw a Ferrari SUV. Uh, But sorry, different conversation. And um, I hear that, but I don't really think that that's my issue. I do not get up in any given day and wonder who I am. I have very distinct tastes, preferences, um, and a lifestyle I live that uh, I like 90% of the time. Um, I get to do a job that I like, uh, which is artistic and writing. I get to have a podcast where I can talk about (laughs) trauma, healing, and dating. I have a delightful child. I get to travel, well, COVID notwithstanding, um, where and when I want. And um, I think my decoration is beautiful. Somebody was at my house yesterday and she was like, you've done a really great job decorating. And I think I I agree. Um, I feel comfortable. Um, I feel the space reflects me. So these are not issues. I know what I like to do for fun. Um, I went to, I've been to too many parties after post-vaccine. I'm a little exhausted. I can't believe I used to enjoy these so much. I think I need to dial that down. But all of that said, I know who I am and know what I like to do and know what I want. Um, that part of my life has generally never been influenced by guys. I've never pretended to like golf or football or soccer or I don't know, whatever the stuff is they're in. I, we either have things in common or we don't. And I'm fine with that. I don't need to have everything in common. I don't need to be a carbon copy of anybody. I'm not looking for a carbon copy of myself. That would certainly be a lot. It'd be too much talking (laughs) and (laughs) it would be a lot. So I am clear on who I am. I think that the healing part has to be having greater expectations for the person I am looking for and 
right now that feels like a hard road, um, I think the main thing I need to work on is self-worth and worthiness, uh, standing up for myself and not putting up with a whole lot of crap. Um, but it's, it's hard. Um, so I'll tell you the story. I, you know, so I've, I told my therapist this and, um, but I don't know if I've ever told a friend this. So when people ask me what my first memory is, I will usually say it's the time our Rottweiler, so I was three and I wanted to walk the dog because that seemed like a good idea for a three-year-old. So my mother said, oh, okay, you want to walk the dog? I'll give you the leash. Um, and we lived in a brownstone and we had a Rottweiler. And so Rottweiler, I don't know, 100, 150 pounds, me three, I don't know, 15 pounds. I don't know which three-year-olds weigh, 20 pounds, not a lot. And my mother gave me the leash and of course the Rottweiler bounced down the stairs of the brownstone um, that we lived in in Brooklyn and took me with her. And I remember like, well, tumbling down the stairs behind the dog. I don't think I must have not broke a bone. So um, on the whole, I guess it worked out. But that was like one of my first memories. But to be honest, I will tell you what my first memory is. My first memory is my mother saying to me, your father never wanted children and he'll never love you like I do. And it's a constant refrain from my childhood. Um, Whenever she would drop me off, um, well, they were divorced. Well, they weren't quite divorced, but they did. My father had every other weekend. And whenever she would drop me off at his mother's house where he lived initially, she would say, well, you know, do whatever you're going to do with your father. But, you know, he never wanted you. He never wanted kids. He didn't want to raise kids in America um, in the 70s or 80s. And, um, you know, he doesn't love you like me. I really wanted you. I really wanted to be a parent. And to take that message into the relationship with my father was hard. So my perception from my childhood was that my father never loved me and didn't want me. And I think one of the first things my therapist said to me years ago was, is that true? Um, And I don't know. Like when she asked me that, I really had to sit back and think about it because it was the truth. It's the truth. I don't know if I still believe it, but it's the truth I believed for so many years and sort of fundamentally framed who I believed I was. I was this person who, you know, was born with one parent who didn't want her and didn't love her. And that belief, um, built upon others, I guess, uh, sort of framed my sense of worthiness. My sense of worthiness started with not being wanted. And it really makes me think that, um, one of the issues that I've had in relationships is that I feel really comfortable with people who don't want me. <laughs> you don't want me, let's hang out. You want to be with me? Let's let's do this thing. Um, I was thinking about it because um, later in this book, uh, one of the guys says to me, you know, I'm this great person, but I don't want you. And I... I actually still don't know what to do with that. Like, I'm trying to figure out why, and I know I should not be on the why question, but it's one of the ones that niggles at me. Why would someone hold themselves out as this great person and then in the next breath be like, well, you can't have him? Um, I just kind of don't get it. Um, Not that I need to get it. Um, But I continue to pursue, hang out, spend time with, people who don't want me, don't like me, um, all their actions and their words suggest that. And I still sort of hang on, like waiting, hoping that one day they'll love me. And that makes zero sense. And I don't want to do it anymore. And I've been really good for a few weeks not doing that. And my hope is to stretch that out forever and only spend time with the people who are like hell yes or fuck yes and not eh, equivocal or eh, I could hang out with you but I'd rather you know maybe if I really literally don't have anything else to do 
um, you'll be last on the list, but hey, you're at least you're on the list. And I really, really, really have zero desire to do that anymore. Um, I keep trying to clear them out. I think there's one left. Um, and I am spending some time thinking about that. I mean, even in these chapters about the summer, and by the way, it's blazing hot out. Thank God for air conditioning. But in the, you know, even the sociologist, you know, started out with, oh, hey, I'm in an open relationship, so I'm looking for, like, a side check. And um, I, you know, it's summer and, you know, he's around. And I'm trying to figure out if either A, I should probe that more, or B, refuse to be anybody's side check, even if it's just a casual thing. I mean, I don't relish, like, waking up to, well, let me call this guy, and if he's got nothing to do... He can visit the the side chick. I don't even know how that happened. Like, I don't know how that happened to me, but I think that I have to be the main chick or nobody's chick at all. Um, And it's going to be, I don't know, it's going to be some time until I figure that out. I was talking to a friend uh, yesterday morning um, while exercising because thank God for being able to get back out and exercise. Um with other people, not by myself. And we were talking about dating. And so she divorced um, a few years ago, but she's a few years older than me. So probably about the same time, um, like in life um, that I did. And she was talking about what she did to make choices and stop, stop hanging out with the fuck boys and the cute guys and the I show up two hours later than I say I'm going to show up, even though I don't seem to have an, uh, anything to do or any obligations, and get serious. And she was saying that, like, you know, after her divorce, she spent a couple of years just fussing around. And then one day she woke up and she's like, this is not going to do anymore. I got to put all these um, side guys um, aside and really focus on trying to find a partner. And she did. So she dated deliberately and we were talking about eHarmony and I have my thoughts on that but she put a profile on eHarmony and was serious about finding somebody who you know had a job and a real income and was okay with her having a job and a real income um, who had a degree or a postgraduate degree or whatever it was um, that was on her criteria and she said she went out with only people who met that criteria until she sparked with one or more and saw where that went and now she's like five or more years in to a relationship um that came from that and that sounds like a reasonable rational way to sort of go about things uh but she's got one of those brains she's got one of those like math science brains that sort of you know does that um i have a brain that's like hey he's cute and i don't know what but I appreciate that approach and it's something I think I'm going to do because one of the things I was thinking about after I did that gumball love interview was that I focused too much on non-important things and I gave too much time to people who I would never give time to in real life. Um, I mean, I've been to parties (laughs) uh, post-vaccine and I realize, like, at parties, like, you know, you see people and you're like, I'm not talking to them. I don't feel like it today. Um, I don't want to hear what they have to say. Oh, that guy's always annoying or whatever it is. And you avoid them. But with dating apps, I was certainly giving too much time to that just because they swiped right on me. Um, And, you know, you'd go on these dates. And um, as I talked about in the memoir, they never read the profile. Um, They weren't interested in getting to know anything about you. They couldn't show up on time. They couldn't plan a date. I'm not even sure if anywhere in this memoir there's somebody who planned a date who was like, let's meet at a location. I will get there on time and be kind. Um, And that's like not a high bar. So I'm going to come September make an effort to only do that and I guess I'll report back because I think it'll be interesting I guess I won't be on like two to three dates a weekend but maybe 
the dates that I go on will be with people who can <laughs> adult. That's all. Just adult. You know, pay your bills. <laughs> Show up. Have a car. Or just, just adult. Um, and then we can go from there. It'll be interesting <laughs> dating while also looking back at all the mistakes I made. But hey, you know, it's a cautionary tale and I finally got I got I got the lesson. I got it. It's it's in, it's in deep. It has been instructive. I will not make the same mistakes again going forward, at least consciously or rationally. So wish me luck. Chapter 35, The Married Man, September 24. It had to happen. The odds of meeting only single and available people online are not 100%. Enter the married man. To be 100% clear, when I came back to California after a summer away, I changed my profile from I don't know or some derivation to long-term relationship or the equivalent on the various apps. In my head, that implied that the man had to be available for that. Men must have some completely different understanding of the English language. It's like the match I got yesterday from a guy where our OkCupid compatibility was at 96%. He was good looking and I was happily clicking through his profile until he got to the description of the woman he wanted. She had to be thin. I looked down at my post-baby body, a full-length picture of which I'd included in my profile following dating expert advice. Because men are visual. If they don't like how you look, they'll swipe left and move on. So I included a shot from the summer where I'm wearing a short skirt and short sleeves. My profile reads, curvy. And yet this guy clicked on me. For a hot minute, I considered swiping right. Because except for that one caveat, it looked like we have gotten along like a house on fire. This paragraph-long digression was just a quick illustration of the fact that men don't read. I'm going to be honest. The first text from the married man off app wasn't a surprise. His screen name was Vic, but he messaged with his real name. I would learned from Drummer Boy that a lot of people don't use their real name. Some obvious, like jacked guy or sexy guy, but others weren't as obvious because they were real names, just not the guy's real name. After his real name, his opening salvo was a picture of him on vacation with his adult children. It was a great shot. He sent some others of him at the Hollywood Bowl, an open-air live music venue, and at the Pantages Theater in Hollywood, and him traveling abroad this year. As I love live performance and travel, I was kind of excited because we had that in common. He already had season tickets, and I would not, if we dated, have to drag him to plays or musicals. Even though I'd vowed not to do any more app chatting or texting, I indulged him because he wanted to text before meeting. The downside of texting? It takes up time I'd rather spend writing. The upside of texting? Red flags. The first was he wanted pictures of me. This constant request I can't figure out. I already determined months ago I was not, under any circumstances, sending nudes. Throwing zero shade on those who do, but that's not me. I have no body shame, and I'm happy to have sex with the lights on, but nudes for your phone ain't happening. Last time I checked, the internet provided plenty of options for men to find naked women of every stripe for free in seconds. They did not need to add me to that mix. Second, he did that thing that drives me batty. The married man. So it occurs to me that perhaps you are on the site to gain material for a book, or are you really here to meet someone? I'm very open-minded, but it would be nice to know. Me? Oh my god. That question drives me batshit crazy. I get it a lot. I honestly have to say that I also write about pedophiles and child sex trafficking, yet no one thinks I'm researching that. Gets off soapbox. Honestly, my writing life has zero relationship to real life. That's what I really said word for word. What I really wanted to say was, me? If you have a billion dollars in a six-pack abs, then yes, I'm doing research. I didn't know because that wouldn't be nice third red flag? This text after we made a plan to meet up for lunch in West Hollywood. The married man. Also, before we meet, I want to give you some upfront disclosure and all fairness. 
I am still married, and my son, wife, and I still under the same roof. Are you still breathing? Me. Okay, so what exactly does that mean? The married man. It means that I'm still married and I date outside my marriage. Was that a bit too honest? Me. I'm not sure there's such a thing as too honest. Does that mean it's open? The married man. No, more of a don't ask, don't tell situation. We are following the Clinton's lead on this. LOL. Your thoughts? At this point, it was about 8.30 at night, and I was getting my son through a bath and making sure he used deodorant and that he brushed his teeth thoroughly now that he was out of his first stage of braces and had just been to the dentist to scrape away all that had accumulated in the past few months. Now, I have to be honest. I really want to go to lunch with a married man. This was a train wreck that I would have loved to have seen in person. Because that would have been a freaking fascinating research for a book somewhat down the line that was not romance. I resisted the urge because my goal was a long-term relationship, and that would have been a huge frolic and detour off the road to what I wanted to be on. Me? Good morning. I've had time to think about this and get much-needed sleep, of course, and I don't think we're a match. I have no judgment about open relationships or DADT or to steal from Dan Savage doing what needs to be done to stay married and stay sane. I'm looking for a serious long-term relationship with someone who is in a similar place as me. The married man. No problem. I certainly understand. It's not for everyone. I appreciate your consideration and I hope you appreciate the full disclosure up front. You seem like a wonderful and delightful person and if you have a change of heart, I would love to meet you. Sincerely, his real name. I have so many thoughts, few of which are charitable. I will say that I don't consider a week later upfront disclosure. That could have been text number one. The lesson here for me though is that I went against my instinct The texting is a horrible waste of time, and going forward, I won't do it again. Oh my god, that freaking guy. The thing is, I don't even remember his real name. It wasn't Vic. Who knows what it was? Um, I'd have to go way back and look at my phone. But, and I probably should just out him. Um, But he was, he... uh, Does any man think that a romance starts with, I'm cheating on my wife? Because that's not how they start. Um, They usually start with two people who are available, you know, 99% of the time, um, who are available for a relationship, don't necessarily want one, but find one and fall in love. It doesn't start with, hey, I'm cheating on my wife, but I call that honesty. Um, actually I posted on Instagram like a few weeks ago, um, this sort of thing because I kept running into these guys who were like, I'm honest, I'm honest, I'm honest, which I now know is a flag for I'm lying, I'm lying, I'm lying, but they're all like, I'm honest and, but I don't have any feelings for my wife or whatever. And I'm like, that's super interesting, but I literally have no idea, no idea, no, uh, desire to be involved with you and your wife. Like, I just, like, I'm not that desperate. Like, the city's big. There's lots of people. There's got to be a lot of single people. There's got to be a sufficient number of single people who are willing to deal with my crazy. And none of which involves you being married and calling it disclosure. Oh, my God. Like, I dated this guy, like, after this, um, who lied about it. No, he was... What did he, he said he was divorced, and then he said he wasn't quite divorced yet. Then it turned out he had just moved out, and it turned out that nobody had filed for divorce. And I was like, I'm out. And he's like, I don't have any feelings for her, yada, yada. You know, you know, we could have something here. We could be partners or whatever. And I was like, this is all very interesting, but I'm going to leave you to that. And he's like, well, what do you want me to do? Throw away years of marriage? (laughs) And I'm like, you do what you want with your marriage, but I'm not going to be sitting around like as a spectator to the end of it, the middle of it, the whatever, you know, you've been cheating the whole time. And I'm not like adding myself to the list of people that you're cheating on your wife with. Um, So not cool. Uh, But what are you going to do? I mean... Well, I guess one of the questions I ask if I'm going to start uh, dating again is, hey, are you married? Um, it seems like something I shouldn't have to ask. And yet here we are. So um, I'm back in West Hollywood. I'm slightly jet lagged and uh, but got to get got to get back on the ball. 
And um, I unpaused my profile on Hinge like yesterday and I just got bored with it. I'm just like, I don't know if I want to have text conversations with these guys. Like I just, I don't know. I'm trying to like gin up interest in it. Like I want to meet someone, but I don't want to put the effort into like swiping through like lots and lots of photos. So, you know, I talked about this like a couple weeks ago, but I met this guy and, um, Actually, in a minute, I'm going to go look at the text he sent last night because it's really long, like long enough that you get like a carrot on your iPhone and you click it and then it opens up like a whole page of text. And um, I woke up in the middle of the night looking at it and I was like, oh, this is a lot of information. I'm going to have to close this. But um, and look at it later um, when I can like uh, digest and respond appropriately. So the thing is, I met this guy and I met him in person and I think I might really like him in a different context where he not, you know, say like, um, thousands of miles away, um, because dating somebody or being in a relationship like that is just another flavor of unavailability. Um, it just, you know, they're emotionally unavailable. They're physically unavailable. Imagine that. But I haven't, you know, it's only been a few weeks and the conversation is still like really fascinating. I really enjoy talking to him every day. And, um, it has been just sort of an eye opening experience because even though he's from like a culture, which I think is like a lot more macho than, um, American culture, if that's even possible, (laughs) maybe they have like more macho, but less toxic masculinity. I don't know. Um, he is really upfront with like how he feels about everything. And it's really interesting. He's like, well, I like spending time with you or I like doing this. Or he was describing something yesterday about going into a situation where he felt uncomfortable. And he said, I went into the situation, I felt uncomfortable. And then he had like an analogy for like, you know, relating the discomfort. Basically he was saying it was sort of similar to going back to visit your childhood home and your childhood bedroom. And you're like, that was mine, but it's not who I am anymore. And I thought it was super interesting, his ability to talk about how he feels Um, and then also like sort of frame it in a way or explain it in a way that I can relate. Um, and that is really super interesting. It would be great if this guy lived in the same place as me and not where my summer house is at. Um, but you know, whatever. So, you know, I'll probably see him when I go back. I might go back, um, for Christmas. I don't know. I'd have to look at plane reservations and with like a COVID surge, I don't know you know, riding a plane for a lot of hours with a mask is not the biggest joy of my life. But, um, so it'd be interesting to go back and see him and sort of hang out again. Um, but what he gave me was like a window into what it's like to spend time with a guy who is more emotionally mature than the guys I've spent time with. So he's younger than me. And, um, Honestly, I think by my age, he'll be like, like right on, like right where he needs to be and like his like emotional development and availability and, um, having a good self assessment of like his, uh, what do you want to call it? His, uh, flaws as well as his really good points. So we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I may get up on the apps. I may give it like a couple weeks or a couple months, but the first thing I need to do is I need to have a hard conversation. It's the last one I need to have and I need to sort of extract this guy. And what's really funny about it is the like I roll up, okay? Like having just got off a really long flight and um, the person who drove me home was like, oh, I can't turn around in your like driveway and back. And I was like, what do you mean you can't turn around? Like, you know, just back in to the space next to my car and, you know, then, you know, turn around. And he looks at me and he goes, there's a car next to you. And I was like, what, what? And so this guy who doesn't like me, um, (laughs) and has told me 10 different ways and doesn't want to spend time with me, his, his car is at my house. Like, and the thing is like, the week before. So I'm texting this new guy and we're having these like sort of in-depth conversations about love and philosophy. And then the old guy texts me and he's like, Hey, when are you coming back? And all I can think of is, so you need to know when I'm coming back so you could ignore me close up as opposed to ignoring me from far away. 
And at no time, like, honestly, to be honest, like, I sort of knew the car was here because my neighbors mentioned it. But because they're like, you know, there's a car. I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. But part of me thought that what he was going to do was he was going to come here and get the car. And so when I got here, then he could have been cleared out. But no, it's there. He knows I'm here and I haven't heard from him. So it's Sunday and well, I'm a little tired because jet lag, but I'm debating between like calling him if he's in town, I don't even know, and sort of like inviting him over so I can have that final hard conversation and maybe he can take this car and <laughs> drive it home um, and not leave it here. But I haven't yet um, decided if I'm going to do that. But to be frank, um, I have learned a lot. Um, it was a long summer and I am ready to sort of clear out these guys. Um, I was thinking about this like in a foreign language that I speak and, you know, there's like this phrase in the foreign language, like you can step in the door or you can step out of the door, but you can't stand in the doorway. And this guy is standing in the doorway and needs to get the heck out. I'm Jolie Moore, and this has been 51st Dates, the podcast. If you enjoyed listening, I hope you'll share, rate, and review it on Apple Podcasts. It will help others find the craziness that is dating in Southern California. Also, please hit the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you'd like to read ahead, my memoir, 51st Dates, is available wherever books are sold. A link is always included in the show notes. I'm also a romance writer. If you want to know more about my books, please visit joliemore.com for more information. You can also follow me on Instagram at xojoliemore and on all social media at the same handle, xojoliemore. Thanks for listening, and I'll be in your ears next week.